So he's talking about um, Aqidah and understanding the importance of Aqidah. And obviously I had to fast forward it. And I'm going to stop at some of the sections that were really, really like impactful to me. So um, in the meantime, I'll be waiting for the guests. The link is pinned. So anybody that wants to join um, that's anonymous, then you're welcome to. And there is multiple. If you guys can't hear it, let me as know. As well about Muslims and fighting against against them, and uh, uh, you know, Sahih Muslim and the rock speaking and all of that. So the time will come. The question is, when the time comes, when you look at Muslims today, do you believe already? I, I want you to actually be sincere with yourself. Sit down and say, okay, are Muslims today the way we are as an ummah today? You know, the TikTok ummah. You think the TikTok Ummah and uh, you know LGBTQ Ummah is ready for for this? They, are we ready when the time comes? So how can we be ready? You know what what separated us from the previous generations? Okay, cool. generations of the Sahaba. May Allah Azza be pleased upon them all, and then generations of the Tabi'een and Atba'u Tabi'een is what they believed. Is their Aqeel? Is their Iman? What they had or they held in their hearts, deep in their hearts, that is what separated them from us. That is what made them have the victory that they have. Now, when the time comes, we need to be prepared. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ وَمِنْ غِبَاتِ الْخَيْلِ تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ وَعَدُوَكُمْ I'm prepared for them. Who's them? All disbelievers. Equally. Doesn't matter who they are, right? All of them. What is Allah asking us to prepare? قوة. What is قوة? Is strength. Now, many ulama said strength here is not referring to military power. It's not referring to weaponry. And why? Because Allah in the next verse says, وَمَنْ رِبَاطِ الْخَيْفِ And from horses. And horses is military power, right? It's weapons. It's like, you know, if you have guns today, there was horses that time. So Allah Azza wa is saying, قوة first. What is the قوة? What is this uh, strength that we have to prepare? Other than the military weapons, is the strength of Iman. The strength of belief, that, that which you have in your heart, deep within your heart. That is the most important. And by the way, I'm sitting right here. So <laughs> it's not like I'm at a distance away. <laughs> but if you haven't seen my face, that's exactly where it's at. You know, if you're talking about like finding Waldo, this is exactly where I am. Uh, now, he makes a very strong point right here. Obviously, uh, we have full knowledge that everything is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but there is a, a requirement for him to change our condition, right? So we have to change the condition of our of our inner selves. And really, this is kind of where he's bridging the gap um, in regards to Iman and how important it is for us to be upright individuals and upright people and following the Quran and Sunnah to the best of our abilities, okay? So if you're just tuning in right now, this is kind of where he's um, bridging the gap to in regards to the catastrophic situation that's happening right now. Um, so keep that in mind. Why? Because you can, we can speak, you know, and, and alhamdulillah, many people speak, you know, we love speaking as, 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 uh, human beings, we love to talk. We, we love to hear ourselves talk. But when the time comes, are you... By the way, fun fact. Okay. Really, really fun fact. Uh, there are other creatures that have the ability to communicate. Okay. So, uh, chimpanzees communicate, whales communicate. You know, you name it. There's tons of creatures that communicate. Um, and here's a question for you guys. What makes our communication different compared to the communication of these other creatures? So do me a favor and just type it in chat. What do you think makes our communication different? There's obviously more than one correct answer. So uh, let me hear some of your guys' responses. Why would we be different or what makes us special? Yeah, I'm definitely Mufti Morris. No way, man. Not a chance. I am I am good. Humble in my little audience, uh, my little audience segment. So what makes us uh what makes us different? Wi-Fi makes us different? Yeah, all right. <laughs> sure, why not? Why not? Hi, Sam Rahtullah. Welcome. Yeah, clarifying the question. So uh, all there's lots of creatures that can communicate, right? What makes our uh, ability to formulate language and to uh, speak and communicate so much uh, more potent? Or why are we so different compared to creatures? So like, for example, you know, an atheist might say, 
uh, we can uh, we can say that chimpanzees have the ability to communicate, so therefore they can kind of draw a, a, a similarity from there and, and link ancestry and link all this other stuff, right? Uh, we have more languages as massive differences uh, with how they function. Okay, this is correct. So we can study more than one languages. So we have more than one way to communicate. Uh, language is not limited. Um, I would I would agree to this. Uh, to a degree, right? Uh, here's another one. Our ability to know of the revelation and choose to obey or disobey, tell the truth and lie. Okay, very good. I think that um, uh, also there's uh, primates and stuff like that that do also lie. Reasonable speech, good. The mind, good. Okay. These are all really good responses, guys. So one thing that you can add to the repertoire, I'm going to give it away because I don't want to take uh, up too much time. One thing that you could add to the repertoire is we're the only creature on the planet that has the ability to archive it. Um, they can communicate, right? There's creatures out there that can communicate, but we're the only ones that can write things down and, um, and, and pass it on. So we have the ability to preserve it through writing, right? when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he taught us by the pen, right? Uh, when he says, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, iqra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bil qalam. Right? So this is, this is something that separates mankind from previous creatures like crazy, right? Okay. You're going to act. Like if I bring like five random people here, you know, we're going to do random selection and we take you put you in a plane and we drop you in the middle of, of gaza and we say okay there you go this is a sniper this, this, this. what are you going to do all of the people are going to run away they will run away and you know by the way running away from jihad you know a lot of people don't like this word but here we are saying it we're talking about islam and the islamic rules you know very peaceful don't worry so we say running away from jihad is a major sin is a major sin yeah, al farar min al-Zahf is, is a major, major, one of the biggest major sins. But if you bring five people and you randomly drop them with a, you know, airplane, they most likely they're going to run away. They go like, oh, you want me to fight against, you know, aircraft and, you know, submarines and you giving me a few snipers? They're not going to do it. So what separates that generation of the Sahaba, who were, or then the generation of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who were... Bedouins with no military power, with nothing, was their iman, their faith. Okay, now they fought in Uhud, this is pretty. This is profound. He's going to bring up battles, right? Which is exactly the point. And right now we have a global battle going on, not just uh, against politicians, uh, not just against uh, major military powers, uh, but we have a major battle going within ourselves too. So. Uh, is this the time that you put your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And is your, as you're kind of checking your iman and all these things that are going through your head on what you can and can't do. So um, when he was speaking right here, one key takeaway that was going through my mind is not developing a sense of hopelessness and just doing anything that you possibly could, right? Even if it means co-correcting your own action, meaning like, how are you conducting yourself? How are you with your five daily prayers? How are you with your fasting? How are you with staying away from the haram and going towards the halal? Uh, how are your eating habits? Are you taking care of your body? Are you sleeping? Are you doing all these things that are bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following Quran and Sunnah? And the idea now is to strengthen your dua because dua is the best weapon uh, that a believer has, right? So keep that. That was what was going through my mind here. Now, obviously, he's going to bring up battles. three times the uh, uh, in battle against three times the number. What made them win? And the other side having the weapons, they barely have anything. It was their iman. It was what they had in their hearts. So the time will come in which we will need this. We will need people who are prepared. They understand why they're here in this life. They understand what they believe, and they understand what they're supposed to do. Now, uh, we can talk about Palestine. Alhamdulillah, I have talked about Palestine multiple times. I talked about the history, you know, and I talked about why why these people, what they're doing is transgression. I don't, I don't think anyone would want to say two brain cells would, would like struggle to find out who's the, whose side is being oppressed, you know? Like you don't need brain cells literally to just figure out that 
people in Palestine are being persecuted, right? So what we need is is that is the aqidah. Now, what is aqidah? Or before we say what is aqidah, what is the importance of it? When we say the word aqidah, a lot of people hear the word but they don't understand. You know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm assuming many many people hear the word but they don't know what the word means. Aqidah is from aqad al-shay is when you tie something. That which the belief that you tie on your heart, you know, you tie it tightly on your heart. It is there. It is covering and tied and tied on your heart. This aqidah is the faith, is the belief that you will have tied in your heart. But this belief is also six, specifically six things. Who knows what these six uh, six things are? Okay. Now, do you guys know what the six things are? If you have heard the lecture, okay, no problem. You can still list out what the six things are in regards to. Uh, the Articles of Faith. Uh, feel free to type out any one of them in the chat, and I'm happy to confirm. Obviously, I'm going to give it away here in a little bit, um, but see if you can come out with the with the six things because he's going to. The, the reason why is because he does, mashallah, he does such an amazing job of layering the depth, right? And as you're listening to, uh, as we're listening to him speak. I want you to think, uh, or at least I'll share my thought with you. The thought that I was having was it is absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible that, that Islam has this type of depth and no other religion can offer this, period. Like, absolutely, period, point blank, that's it. So, okay, belief in the messengers, great. I'll give it another 10 or 15 seconds. What are the other articles of faith? And I'm trusting you on your honor. You can most certainly Google it and cheat, but you know, on your honor, try to do a little bit of a brain teaser for yourself. What else do we have? Angels decree Quran. Okay, cool. All right. Belief in the day of judgment, great. Ha. MashaAllah. Okay, before you say, who else knows? MashaAllah, so we have this brother, this young brother here, our young brother, okay, another person, MashaAllah. We have this young brother here in the midst of the crowd, who knows? We have this brother there, okay, MashaAllah, more people raising their hands, okay, great, great, alhamdulillah, okay. So who can tell me one? You tell, you tell me one. Huh? I believe in Allah, yes. Belief in Allah, Azza wa Jal. So, now, the most important one. You guys started with the messengers, the angels, the decree of the Quran, but the most important one, la ilaha illallah. <laughs> okay, but it's all right. Just again, a friendly conversation, alhamdulillah. Now everyone knows that you give me the chief code now, yeah? Okay. So, the six <laughs> articles of faith that we believe as Muslims is what we call aqeed. The six articles of faith. Believe in Allah, believe in His books, believe in His angels, believe in His messengers. Believing in the last day, believing in Qadr, right? These six articles of faith. Okay, now here's the thing. The reason why you didn't think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as uh, obviously first is because uh, it's a no-brainer, right? So it it's one of those things. But here's, here's why it's so important. It's important to recollect and it's important to reflect and just take a minute and be like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? So um, even though that we're connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our salah, through our dua, uh, and, we're, and, and our awareness, okay, the, the cool part about listening to these people of knowledge speak is they know how to articulate it for us. They know how to put it in, a, in, a, in its rightful place, right? So it was just a healthy reminder, right? That we believe as Muslims is what we call aqidah. But not just, okay, if I ask anyone here, do you believe in Allah? Is anyone going to say no? Is anyone going to say no? <laughs> He's talking oh, to not, you know, <laughs> Well, you're doing your division. So, no one is supposed to say no, right? Everyone's going to say yes. So, if everyone believes in Allah, you're going to say yes. But if I ask you the next question, what does it mean to believe in Allah? Okay. So, now, this is where he really starts to, and, and hopefully you guys can really cherish this, okay? Because, um, Obviously, I was running through my head as to what does it really mean to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Like, wh how, do you, how do you articulate this? And how do you articulate it in a way that it is transmittable, that somebody can understand it? 
and um, how can we put the how can we put the the correct things into focus? And when you say that you believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, naturally everybody knows the first one. Okay, so there's four layers to this. There's four layers to this belief, right? So I'm going to give away the first one because it's 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 kind of a no brainer. But again, it's one of those things that is easily overlooked. So in order to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the requirement? What's the requirement to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And feel free to drop your answer in the chat. And if you're having a, a difficulty, uh, if you're having a difficult time with it, I can try to put it in a in a very simple way. So what's the criteria to believe in a banana? If somebody were to tell you, hey, go get me a banana, right? Okay, so we got, there's one, uh, nothing like him, not born, begets, doesn't mean it. This is from the Quran, okay, alhamdulillah. However, let's just say, let's just say that you never, you never read the Quran. Let's say you never read the Quran. Can you still believe in Allah? Having a sound mind, yes. There is a there is a condition. Uh, be sincere, yes, for sure. However, it's it's a lot simpler than that. And when I tell you the answer, <laughs> you're gonna look at me like, "Yo, Morris, are you serious, man? Like you're 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 just like kicking my goat, man." Um, okay, we are his slaves, creator. Yes, exactly. The need to exist, right here. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, so. You have to believe in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for you to have any type of belief in Allah. If you if you don't uh, believe in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how would you believe anything else? How would you believe that it, you, you, you're, you're not upon that, right? Now, I know it sounds like a complete no-brainer, but again, it's something that think about it from a perspective of being able to articulate it, okay? Now there's three more, there's three more layers of this, or excuse me, not layers, but there's three more uh, properties, three more elements to, uh, to, to, to this. Okay. So let, let's go ahead and continue and let's explore these three layers inshallah. How many people are going to answer is the question, right? And when we go into details now, of if you tell me, okay, believing in Allah, to believe in Allah Azza wa Jalla, you need four things, right? Four things. You can say three or four, but can some people tell me who these things? Maybe many people would be. Now, when I ask about details, now and I'm, by the way, I elected to keep it at four, um, but I can see where there can be a combination of one of them, right? So uh, it's totally fine. Okay, what does it mean of every single one of these three things? Will you be able to tell me? The, the number shrinks. The more questions you ask. And this was so true, by the way, guys, when he asked the audience, I know that you can't see the audience at all times, but uh, obviously I was there, right? And here I am uh, rigorously taking notes because it's not every day that you get a chance to uh, hear these people live, right? So just a friendly reminder first to myself and to you guys, but as you're viewing content like this, if you really find something profound or something that really sticks out, uh, have, a note, have a notebook out. Right. Like I, I have like a little pocket size notebook kind of thing. And I just <clears throat> come to lie, bring it with me. You can take it to your hood buzz. You can take it to um, because these are people that, have, you know, obviously studied up on stuff and it's worth hearing them out and it's worth taking notes. So as he keeps asking the audiences, the more and more difficult questions, I'm telling you right now, the hands shrunk almost entirely. And everybody, not everybody, I don't speak in absolutes, but a majority of people got stumped on the second one, right? So uh, right after the existence of a loss of data, majority of people got instantly stumped. Okay. So let's explore. The more the number of things. Who can hear? And, and this is going to be sad, you know, but inshallah, take this question as something that encourages you to behave in a better way in the future. Who sitting down here can tell me the 99 names of Allah, Azza wa Jal, all of them? And their meaning. Their meaning. Okay. So if I, and this is important. Now, obviously, I don't even, I myself don't have the 99 names memorized, right? I have uh, some of them memorized, which I utilize to make dua because that's, there's a proper etiquette in making dua, right? Um, however, 
uh, it's cr it's critical. It's a critical junction to get close to a loss of pound data, right? Um, and and the more uh, actions that we take, the closer that we can get to him. And notice he says it's not just about knowing the names, but knowing the meanings. And where he's going with this is because if you yourself don't know the creator in the manner in which he presents himself to you, how could you get that much closer? It doesn't mean that it's challenging your belief. It's saying that if you truly, truly love your creator, you would spend a little bit of time. You know, even if you learned one name a day, you can learn all 99, including their meanings, uh, within 99 to 100 days, inshallah, right? I ask you, what does it mean, Al-Aziz? You're going to tell me what is the, the difference between Izzatul Ghalaba or Izzatul Quwa? You're going to be able to. If I ask you, is the question, right? So when we say uh, Al Alim, you're going to be able to tell me what is all knowing? It's not the answer. All knowing is just a translation of the word, right? What does it mean that Allah Azza wa is Al Alim? Will you be able to tell me what it means that, that Allah Azza wa is Al Alim, right? And if sadly the majority is going to say no, then how can we worship Allah Azza wa Jal when we don't know who Allah Azza wa Jal is? Okay, can we... so now again, my own personal reflection on this, it's not saying that you can't worship him in the manner that immediately comes to mind. Rather, it's, um, here's what, what came to my mind uh, after a little bit of reflection. If we're trying to increase our concentration within our, our salah, if we're trying to increase our concentration within dua, if we're trying to increase our concentration um, in, in any element of just being aware, right? The closer that we get to Allah subhanahu wa the more and more concentration we will have. So what he's saying is, uh, if you do these things, or at least this is my takeaway, if you do these things to get close to Allah subhanahu wa the next time that you're reciting the Quran and that name comes by, right, you will know uh, how to connect with Allah subhanahu wa on that deeper, deeper, deeper level in which it's intended to be so that you don't have distractions during your prayer. So that was my personal reflection. Now you may have a different one, which is again, totally fine. How can you worship Allah Azza wa Jal? How can you worship Allah Azza wa Jal in a way that he's worthy of being worshiped if you don't know his names and attributes? So, and this is a calamity. Is it a calamity or not? It is a calamity. We are in the state that we're in. A consequence of the, the what's happening today in Palestine is that lack of fundamental belief that Muslims do not hold. It is, it is a main, one of the main reasons, one of the main issues. And this is true, right? We have to, we have to kind of get slapped upside the head a little bit and get reminded, you know, there is such a thing as tough love, right? And this is a form of tough love that uh, Brother Muhammad Ali is giving us. So he's, he's in essence, he's almost coaching you on uh, coming back to the roots, right? Yeah, exactly so, this uh exactly this bro so what you just said right there hits the nail on the head you have to in, in 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 order to indulge in the worship you have to learn these meanings right just like you would be relishing uh, a recipe of something that much more if you have the ability to um if you have the ability to taste the sweetness of it on a whole nother level if you understood the recipe of uh, a meal if you understood the hard work that went into preparing it cooking it, the temperature, the monitoring, exactly everything, the timing, all that stuff, you would be, you would be like, wow, this is more, it just tastes so much better. So think of it as like, if you were in a sushi restaurant and the, the chef was sitting there, alhamdulillah, you know, sushi is halal. So if you were in that sushi restaurant and you see the chef preparing everything so carefully and meticulously and so on, then when they serve it to you, it will taste that much better. Right. So in that same manner, well, uh, use of that, I like to use that word. To learn these things. Like, uh, today, like we're speaking for maybe 45 minutes or something like that, so I'm not going to bore you too much. So, but Sunday, inshallah, is another two talks. But as, I'm essentially saying this because even these three lectures or talks are not enough to talk about Aqeedah. So don't expect that, okay, okay, Brother Muhammad now is saved us now, right? He's going to tell us, you know, in 45 minutes what we need to do. And let me go back, eat my food when I'm back home. No, <laughs> really, it's not going to work that way, you know? You're going to have to put effort. You're going to have to go home. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to book open books. You're going to have to see people of knowledge teaching you. You know, I, I remember uh, teaching one of the books, the Kitab of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, Rahim Allah, Sheikh Raqib, Ahl Sunnah al It's just 500 pages. But it took a year to explain it. 
Okay. This was not now true. notice. He just says it was just 500 pages, as if like that's nothing. Okay. Whereas to the majority of, of folks, myself included, hey man, 500 pages is a lot to be able to sit there and go through it. But but notice what he said. It took a year, a year to teach it. Okay. So there's different levels of understanding. There's the first read through. Then there's a, a the second read through uh, to actually have a greater comprehension. Uh, then you have to be able to connect and thread the thoughts and the ideas. And then when you're teaching it, you're at a level of mastery, right? So um, just to put it in perspective, right? Uh, it, let's say, for example, you were going to college and you were getting your bachelor degree, right? Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Uh, it's a great achievement. When you get your bachelor's degree, it's almost like reading through a book the first time. You, you, you come across new concepts. You start exploring these concepts. You, you see the bridges between certain concepts, okay? Then when you're getting your master's degree, you're starting to learn the models that are built by other people of these base concepts, right? So you have concepts in psychology, you have concepts in chemistry, you have all this stuff. Then you have the models that are built by these people. And now, once you understand the model, once you understand the model, when you're going towards even higher education, like let's say, for example, you're getting your PhD, somebody who is getting their PhD has not only the ability to understand these models, but they have the ability to construct their own models and then to integrate them into existing models. Okay. And this is where like the envelope is pushed. Okay. So notice what he did is he says, yeah, it's only 500 pages, but it took a year uh, to teach it. Right. So um, when you're dealing with somebody that has a PhD in something, you have to respect the, 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 the very minimum that they have of an understanding of these models and then they, they themselves can craft their own model. Now, whether it's a it's a good model or a bad model, that still remains to be seen. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of PhD people that are just, their models are faulty or something doesn't work. But the idea is that they have the capacity to push the envelope to that to that degree, okay? Whereas many people just simply don't, right? Deep explanation of the book, right? And this is, a, this is not even detailed book about Aqeedah. He's explaining his own method, and it's a very small book, you know, it's 500, it's small. Okay, hey, notice. And he's not going into Notice, that. he's explaining his own method, right? Which means he's explaining his own model, right? So this person, the author of this book, right, obviously at a PhD level, and now he's transmitting the information. The detail, yeah? took almost a year explaining that book. So it takes time to learn, just like it takes time, you know, who here went to school? I'm assuming everyone here has gone to school, yeah? Inshallah, yeah. So if you've gone to school, how many years do you spend in university? Usually it's four, unless you're doing medicine, you're doing nine or more, right? So minimum four years. How many years do you expect to learn about the Aqeedah? I believe. It should be more, right? But we're telling you at least you have to put some effort in your free time to learn about your Aqeedah, the beliefs that you have to have as a Muslim. And this is true. Aqeedah is to tie the thing, and we tell you the six articles of faith. Before now, we go into the, 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 the cool part about this, by the way, is um, you have the ability to do this at your own pace, right? So it's not like you're uh, you're someone that's pressed for time. Hey, you've got like, for example, when you're going through school and stuff like that, you're pressed for time. You're like, you've got exams coming up. You've got all these things. You have to No, uh, when you're doing a self-study on Aqidah, Take it bit by bit, take it bite size, but really crystallize your knowledge, right? Like I think of the companions, uh, um, think of the the way that they would study the Quran, right? They would do a few ayat at a time, sometimes up to 10 ayat at a time, but they wouldn't move on until they under not only just memorized it, but they understood the meaning and its depth, right? Before they went to the next segment. So they really, they spent time with, uh, the Quran. They spent time with uh, Kitab Allah, right? Articles of faith, I'm not going to go into all of them, probably maybe just one even today. Uh, but before we go into it, I want to say something else. Where do we derive 
are sources of knowledge when it comes to religion. Uh, uh, where where do we derive it? Yes, Quran and Sunnah. That's it. Alip Sama. Ah, Jama. What else? Yes. Okay. So we have four things. We okay, have this Quran. was really cool. We have the Sunnah, the Hadith of the Prophet is his life, etc. We have the Ijma, the consensus, the agreement of either all scholars in a specific day and age, or the companions of the Prophet on a, on, a, on a matter. And the fourth thing is analogy, and this analogy is based on the Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. Okay. So once again, to repeat that for you, you have the Quran, you have the Sunnah, you have the Ijma, which is the consensus. And then you have uh, the companions with, and right, righteous predecessors. Okay, so um, you know, notice that uh, these are step by step. Meaning, if something is widely explained in the Quran, very apparent, there's there's no need to have a consensus on something. The Quran just straight tells you what it is, right? Like Qul Allahu Ahad. There's there's not a need for consensus on something like that. Okay, but you have this step by step science, this step by step process that's been preserved. Okay, so these are all the things that separate Islam from other religions. So this is part of your, your study on how you take things, uh, you know, step by step. Okay, not just you know, your mind, you know, to bring you a uh, religion. We're not, you know, we're not interested in what you think, right? You, this analogy is based on the Quran and Sunnah. So these are the sources of knowledge. We call them Masadir Talaq al where you derive knowledge from. Now, with whose understanding? This Quran and Sunnah. Okay, this brother here from, as a, from a specific country. This brother here is from another country. His way of thinking is based on, you know, how he was raised. Your way of thinking, my way of thinking. Okay, so who is here? Should we, you know, listen to their explanation of the Quran and Sunnah? Ha. Ha. Who? Do you agree with him? Uh, is, it a, is it the righteous predecessors or who is it? Uh, we are saying right now for the people who didn't hear the question. We have the Quran and Sunnah, we agree. We get our religion from the Quran and Sunnah, right? But who's understanding of the Quran and Sunnah? Today we, there is a calamity. Today is a huge calamity. That calamity uh, is everyone opens, uh, you know, a TikTok channel, uh, this channel, that channel and starts, you know, becoming Shaykh al-Islam. And Shaykh al-Islam, I read this verse yesterday, you know what, this verse actually means this. And he doesn't know how to tie his shoes, but he's going to tell you what the Quran... Okay, now notice, this is a, uh, a straight, you know, textbook example of what we're seeing from the opposition. So, like, you have people that come on our channels, you have people that, um, you know, make posts, make shorts, make TikTok videos and stuff like that. They don't speak a lick of Arabic. Not a lick of it uh, or they they completely bastardize the language and then they think all of a sudden oh i understand quran i understand hadith i understand you know what you meant by this contextually this is the danger that alhamdulillah islam protects uh our, ourselves and the opposition from uh invading proper knowledge right so no other religion can offer this, period. Uh, not only because the language is preserved, but obviously uh, the Quran is preserved, hadiths are preserved, uh, the authentic ones, obviously. So this is kind of what I what, what I was reflecting so on. So we saying. have this calamity today of everyone bringing his own understanding. We've got people rejecting completely the Prophet ﷺ saying, you know what? I will understand this Quran, you know? Prophet ﷺ is just bringing me mail, you know? I'm going to interpret the mail after I got the mail. We have these people, do we, don't we? I know there's not one or two, there's many people like this. So, whose understanding do we take when it comes to the Quran and Sunnah? One more thing also that popped into my mind here as he was speaking. And this this was particularly in regards to people that are like Quran rejectors or, or aka Hadith rejectors. It blows my mind, it blows my mind that you can take someone like the Prophet Isaac and the status that he was elevated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, through the Quran and through all of his efforts and his entire life and just cast him away as just basically, uh, billah, some dude that delivered a message, right? And this is what he was alluding to right here in regards to him just being, you know, a postman. Uh, 
completely blows my mind, right? That somebody can actually think that way and not recognize all of the hardships, including the hardship of receiving revelation, right? Because uh, the Prophet gave us multiple uh, hints and, and uh, you know, straight transmission saying that it's, it's not easy on me at times, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it's a weighty word, right? That the Quran has an extreme amount of weight that can only be bestowed on uh, the heart of the Prophet So for somebody just to cast him aside like that as if he wasn't worth a lick of salt, is just crazy to me. Absolutely crazy to me. Because now when you speak to your friend and you say, Allah says, oh, but my uncle said this. But my nephew said, yeah, we don't care about your nephew and uncle yet. Where, where is the understanding you bring it from? Huh? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. the Sahaba. Okay. We get it not just from the Sahaba, but from the righteous predecessors. We get it from the righteous I predecessors. Understand. They are the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, their students and their students. Why do we get it from these people? Why? What is the reason we get it from these people? The reason we get it from these people is multiple things. First thing is from the Quran. The first evidence that we need to get our understanding from the, the, the Sahaba and the Tanrim and the Bible is the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal explicitly says in the Quran, the description of those companions of the Prophet Allah Azza wa Jal says, Muhammad is Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Those who are with him, they are harsh, strong against the disbelievers, merciful with one another. And you see them prostrating, worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, right? This is the description of the Prophet, uh, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Azza wa says he's pleased with them in multiple different locations, right? He was pleased with those who did the bay'ah. Right? Allah Azza wa Jal said, and, and notice this, this is an attestation for these people. Uh, this is an attestation for the hardships that they themselves went through, uh, as well as a, a glimpse into their character, that they're honorable, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you, know that you're a good person, right? Know that you're doing good and you're upon good and you're upon the straight path. And know that you're also protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why would we not reach out to these people and what their literary works were and what their contributions were? And, you know, this is the, this is really like a profound, profound point, like super, super profound. And it can just be very easily glazed over because our focus is uh, obviously on something bigger, right? Our focus is on the Prophet, our focus is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our focus is on things that so as you're reading the quran um these are like these are gems that really stand out but it's it's only recognizable by somebody that can properly articulate it right yes that he promised them jannah was companions of the progress what are we to, where are we trying to go yeah exactly jannah. so if there is someone who's going to jannah promise jannah i should admit what he's doing isn't it exactly he's going there so let me try to do as he was doing because he's doing the right thing Clearly. and by the way by the way here's the cool part about this right and this is just coming from like a psychological background each of the companions had a different psyche each of the companions would react differently to problems so what's cool is uh because of their difference in personalities and because of their difference in how they dealt with the problem you can see if you were to really look in depth as to how they would deal with these particular struggles, like Omar did not react in the same way that Abu Bakr did, nor Ali, right? So you can you can align yourself with uh, whose psychology fits you best, right? As, as to who you are as an individual. And I think this is another one of those, those gems. Um, obviously I'd have to do a lot more thorough research but there's a pretty cool topic right there. So inshallah, I will, um, I'll try to, to dig a little bit deeper in that, but know that all of our personalities are different and how we handle stress is different and everything. So it's one of those things where you can, you can really, um, there's multiple paths, right? Multiple paths. And each of the companions uh, were correct. Allah Azza wa says in Surah Al-Hadith, why are you not spending for Allah? 
And for Allah is the inheritance of the heavens and the earth. Those who spent and fought before the conquest of Mecca are not equal to those who did after because it was more difficult. Uh -huh. Islam was fewer number, it was more difficult to find that time. After the conquest, there was more strength, so it was easier to find. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla, when He said that, that they're not equal, then Allah said, وَكُلَّ الْوَعَلَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَةِ And all of them, Allah promised Husna. Do you know what Husna is? Husna is the best thing. What is the best thing? Jannah. So Allah is saying he promised his companions Jannah. But is it just that, that he told us he's pleased with them, that he's give, it praised them, and they're praising the Torah and the Injil? The same verse I was reciting. It says that they're praising the Torah and the Injil. The companions of the Prophet are praised there. Is it just that Allah is pleased with them and they're praised? And all? No, but Allah explicitly told us to follow them. Allah Azza wa says in Surah Tawbah, verse 100, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ and the first foreigners from the Muhajirun and Ansar. Muhajirun are those who migrated from Mecca to Medina to fight with the Prophet ﷺ. And the Ansar are those who supported the Prophet when he came to Medina. The Al Sul Khazraj, these tribes that were there that supported the Prophet when he left Mecca and came to Medina. They're all what? Sahaba. They're all the companions of the Prophet. ﷺ. Then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And those who follow them in goodness and righteousness. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to do. So what we call the tabi'een, the students, we call them tabi'een. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ تَبِعِينَ Those who follow them in righteousness, right? So why we say these generations? So Allah says those who follow them in, in righteousness, what is Allah Azza wa Jal saying about them? Ah, what is Allah saying about them? وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ Aha, see what I'm doing? I'm writing. Oh, all these heads are looking over there. And again, mashallah, but look at how many people are actually writing. This gentleman's writing, I'm writing. Uh, there's probably a couple others now. These, these folks' memory is probably much better than mine right but you can see that there's a select few folks in the audience that are really just um they're really just taking it in right i want to uh, for the brevity of time and they are pleased with him allah is prepared for them jannah obviously we won't get through all this you know gardens wherever is flowing so allah is saying that those who follow these companions of righteousness Allah Azza wa Jal have prepared for them gardens. He's pleased with them. He's prepared for them Jannah. So this is from this we take from the Quran. Okay, we follow the companions from the Sunnah. Is that it? No, also from the Hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that the best of generations are my generation. Then the one who come after it, then the one who comes after it. These are the best generations. So notice how he's layering. He's layering, right? The Quran speaks, right? And then the Sunnah speaks, and then it's confirming the other layers. And this is really critical. With because it's all of, it's all guidance for us, but we have to take it step by step. For us to learn from, because they are the best of generations. Prophet said, "Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al khulafa." Upon you is my tradition and the tradition of the khulafa, which were the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, all of these people. So Quran and the, and the evidences are many, many. You know, I can be sat here for two hours just telling you evidences about following the companion and the righteous predecessors. There's many evidences, and obviously just using common sense. Those people are or who are the students, the direct students of the Prophet. So who is best to learn about the Prophet and about religion from the direct students? The people who are direct students sitting down with the Prophet, seeing how the Prophet is behaving, what the Prophet is saying, what the Prophet is doing. They are the best people to learn from. Because they were in the, directly there seeing the Prophet. Not only that, they were there when the verses was, was revealed. Were you there when the Quran was revealed? Any of us? Did you hear the Quran from the Prophet? No. These people heard it directly from the Prophet and took it from him. And they were there with the Quran was descending. In fact, the Quran descended about some of them. Right or wrong? Right. Or and this is... Uh, let me, directly I'm speaks about the companions. You know, like Abu Bakr, uh, radiallahu anhu, being with the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the Lord, or like Zayd. Right. And this is what's profound. What's profound is, and, and sometimes we overlook this stuff, is... These people were there physically living and witnessing the Quran uh, in action, right? They were witnessing the prophecies take place and they were witnessing their entire world shifting like 180 degrees, like full blown shifting, right? So it's overlooked for us and that's, and, and it's only because we're so distant, right? Which is a further attestation to that hadith where the Prophet Islam, says that, you know, Islam came in as a strange thing. It's going to be leaving as a strange thing. So this is 
like revisiting or having these talks and collecting these golden nuggets, all these things, when we're reading the Quran the next time, like for example, when you're reading it tomorrow or inshallah tonight or later today, wherever, whatever time zone that you're in, you will look at it differently when you come across a verse that's talking about the companions, or you will look at it differently should you inculcate this this stuff, right? And Allah is mentioned again as a Qurbani in the Quran, right? Qurbanis are mentioned with name. Because the Quran was even read some of it is about them. Now, so they are for the brevity of time, I just want to I just want to locate where he was talking about um, the other components. Do you, every single one here, probably have have had that experience. Okay, you ask great. Allah Here's the next one. That, say they believe in the existence of Allah Azza wa Jalla. What are the the evidences for the existence of Allah Azza wa Jalla? Is the question. So we're back to the existence. We're the back to the Allah, now, at this point. Allah Azza wa Jalla are different types. There are four. Let's say four things. Who can give me some of them? Huh? Four, four reasons. Yes. Hmm? Fetra. Okay, Fetra is one. Huh. Three more. Okay, so now uh, shara. remember, shara. remember when I was talking about how no religion has this type of depth. Okay, um, we're on the first point still, which is the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This is the first point. Okay, so the first one. In the field of existence, these are the validations for the existence. So he talked about fitra, which is the innate predisposition, right? The second one is the sharh, which is the Quran and Sunnah. So we obviously we have a revelation. Uh, we have a um, we have the Prophet We have the happenings that that transpired. Okay. So this is another level deep, okay, just into the existence. Which is the religion, the Quran, the things that talks about Allah. Is, okay, what else? Two more. Huh? Close, but not yet. Not yet. Huh? Two more. Yes. Creation? No. Huh? Cause and effect. No. No, not that now, notice, these are good responses, guys. It's not that they're bad responses. They're really good. It's just that it's a very difficult question. And uh, what I mean by difficult is the articulation of it is very difficult. It's not every day that somebody tells you, how can you tell me that from a, a from a uh, Islamic standpoint, how can you validate the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We would immediately jump to, the Quran, you'd be like, well, you know, there's a Quran, okay, and and you know, there was a messenger, right, and that's all part of just the uh, shah, the part of the religion, and then some of us could jump into, hey, uh, we have an innate predisposition, which is the fitrah, okay, but what about the other two? So these why these are really golden gems right here, and this is why I love this talk. That's the part of the shara. Huh? See, another person said prophet. No. So there's two things, right? We said fitra, and we said the shara. Two more things. First is his experience. Now we speak sometimes against the Christians. And the yeah, and now he 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 brought up a really good point in regards to the Christians. But yeah, that's here. Say, guys, you know, your religion is not true just because you had a personal experience. That doesn't mean your religion is true, right? But the reason we tell them that that personal experience is not evidence because other religions you can have part of personal experience. So it's a contradiction. Yeah, God is conditional for existence. You know, obviously. But remember, you have to, what, what he's trying to do is he's trying to give you the Islamic reasoning for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can say something like what you just said. However, um, this would fall under, this would fall under one of the categories which he didn't get to, which is fine. I'm going to let him get there. But where, what he's discussing right now is how to articulate it. So God is conditional for existence falls under one of these categories. But if you don't know what the category is, you won't know how to trail back. So you've come to the you've come you've come to a conclusion. What you said is a conclusive statement. You're basically saying that in order for us all to be here, God must exist, right? But how where, under what category do you fall under? And this is the cool part about this talk, right? Um, now what he does bring up, and I'm going to let him. Uh, go into it a little bit more detail is the Christian perspective, because that was the first thing that came to my mind. The first thing that came to my mind is when uh, I speak to a Christian brother or sister and they go, oh, well, 
you know, God is love and I've experienced God in my life. And I, um, you know, my life was this, but now it's this, and it's, it's so much better now. Right. Islam also validates this form of recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, here's the difference. The key difference is it is not the only form. In Islam, you can't have one contradict the other. If any one of these categorically contradicted themselves or each other, we, we would not have a sound model. Okay. So for example, if somebody just says it's strictly based off experience and it's purely my subjectivity, and you guys hear this in the conversations that we have with folks, people say something like, there's nothing that you can do to convince me otherwise, uh, because I've had such and such event happen, or I, uh, I'm speaking to God, or, uh, they'll say, um, you know, I had revelation that was given to me, blah, 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 blah. Right. And you know, just backtrack on some of my videos or some of the other brothers' videos. There's people, you know, one of the dudes that popped into, uh, you know, Brother Muhammad Ali's uh, stream was saying that he was the Mahdi, bro. Like, really? Okay, this is an experience. Now, this experience, if you were to say, okay, well, uh, what, what other thing does it violate, right? Like, did you really stop to think about this, bro? Are you really the Mahdi? So what, did, what does Muhammad Ali ask this gentleman? He asked him, okay, I'm going to go ahead and speak Arabic now. Can you speak Arabic? Because the Mahdi will speak Arabic. So he's using another category to validate the category of his experience. And if not all four of them are hitting, then it's an issue, right? So with our, uh, again, just to kind of bring this back together, uh, the, the difference between our Christian brothers and sisters, they'll say, oh, I've, I've experienced Jesus. It's like, okay, cool. Um, how do you know you were talking to Jesus, right? And let's, okay, we, we check the box for one category. You had an experience. Fantastic. Now let's move to the other category. Let's move to the category of shah. What are you, where's the revelation? Where's the prophethood? Where's this? Where's that? How are you getting to this conclusion that you indeed, indeed did talk to Isa, Isa? And then they fall apart. Whereas Islam doesn't, that and and again, this is huge. But every religion on earth has an experience of who? Of God. Exactly. No contradictions there. Human beings, as a species, if you want to use that term, have an experience with God. You, every single one of you, probably have a, have had an experience. You ask Allah Azza for something that no one else knows about, and you got it. You were in a difficult situation, and Allah Azza saved you, and you asked Him to help you. You have an experience with Allah. It's not just you, but everyone. Muslim or non-Muslim, you have experiences with God, with the existence of the Creator. So, his, so an experience becomes an evidence. Experience becomes an evidence. And then the last thing is what? Is intellect. Okay, now we have the four categories, just to review again. You have your fitra, which is your innate uh, predisposition of things. You have the sharh, which is the religion itself. So Quran, prophethood, revelation, Sunnah, all these things. You have his, which is the experience, and you have the aql. So you can't have a violation. You can't ask somebody an intellectual question as to what's going on with your experience, and they go, oh, just trust me, bro. You can't accept that, right? So with Islam, you have all four of these strict conditions, strict conditions uh, and strict categories that link back to just one. Uh, overarching category, which is just the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We haven't touched up on, on the other three yet. So, the, n you know, notice what's happening here. He's giving you the recipe. He's giving you the recipe, which is the aqidah, right? He's giving you the recipe on how you can falsify what somebody's belief is. This is the, this is the key. It's literally like keys to the kingdom, man. So, uh, inshallah, that you know it's clicking together for you because um, it takes it takes time, right? And it took me some time, and, and hopefully, uh, as it goes on, it, it becomes easier and easier. So now, when it comes to aqal, you have both common sense and you have reasoning, and you have all these uh, things that you can utilize, right? You know, for those who have aqal, for those who have intellect, because we know there's many people who don't have intellect, and because they don't have intellect, they don't believe in, or they outwardly say there's no God, right? But the truth is, if you have aql and intellect, you'd believe in Allah. So we said the hiss, we explained what the, what the experience is. This is an evidence for existence of Allah, right? Then we have the fitra. And I will say the fitra before the aql because I believe the fitra is more stronger than the aql. 
Because it's an, an intuitive thing that you're born with, you believe. Allah Azza says in the Quran, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَى شَهِدْنَا أَنْ تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ Allah Azza says, when Allah Azza took from Adam mankind, his project, he took mankind from Adam, right? This is before we, we are in this life, current life. And then Allah Azza made us testify, every human being. Allah asked us, am I not your Lord? And we all said yes. Do you remember this? Huh? Do you remember it? No, you don't remember it, but the fitrah is there. When you're told about Allah, when you experience these things regarding Allah, this fitrah starts to awake. Deep down you feel, you know what, I know this is true. Even though you don't remember the incident, but the effects of fitrah are there. Allah Azza just says in the Quran in Surah Al-Rum, Fitrat Allah allati fatar al-nas ala ila. Fitrat of Allah that he made the people upon, la tabdila li khabd Allah, you cannot change it. Okay, so now as he was talking about this um, section, here's what was going through my mind. What was going through my mind was, imagine a situation of somebody who is super smart like i'm talking you know wicked high iq but yet they're upon disbelief so uh they have the aql but they may not have had the experience they invalidate the shah and then they're opposing their fitra and if you take that as a recipe like an actual recipe of uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the consequences is that it's 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 not the 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 um, uh, mind, but rather it's the heart that's closed off, and it's the eyes are 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 blind, the ears are deaf, right, and and the the brain or the mind is dumb, right? Like it's hitting those exact points that he was talking about. It's hitting the and you can see how somebody is like electing to be upon disbelief without opening up a segment uh, that is critical to them, to unlocking the truth, right? And obviously, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that opens, but it's a consequence of them saying, I've got all this intellect. I've got all, like, I'm a, I'm a very smart guy. And I'm not going to let anything else override my logic and my reason. So they have closed the gate on themselves. And they're, the thing that is controlling them is literally their own brain. And they're not allowing their heart. And they're not allowing their I intuition uh, in in any which way, shape, or form. And because of that, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to say this again, my own personal reflection, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not open the door for them to want to explore anything in regards to shah which is the religious stuff because they immediately say you you religious people are crazy right so subhanallah right this is this is exactly where the mindset of an atheist is and imagine the the concoction of a recipe that's to the degree to the caliber of intellect and to the caliber of, of atheism right you know i'm talking like stephen hawking type you know stuff compared to some you know joe schmo off the street Right. Like when we were giving Dawa over there in um, in Jersey, there was a, a guy who was a, a dude was a chemical engineer. And uh, when I was taught the first brother, Muhammad Ali was talking to him, finished up with him. And then on his way out, you know, I decided just to stop him for a second. I said, hey, you know, what? what was your interaction like? He's like, oh, the guy was really cool. You know, really nice, uh, really nice guy. I still couldn't reconcile a couple things here and there. Well, I hit him with a, a with some doses of reality. And I asked them, you know, how important is it for you to be upon truth? And how important is it for like your job to be dependent on a result that is a true result? So I was like, what do you do for a living? He's like, oh, I'm a chemical engineer. I'm like, okay, cool. So if you screwed something up, you could technically like cost people their lives, right? Or you could technically like do something where it's just disastrous, right? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. And I said, okay, cool. So you really value the truth and you value a correct result. But he himself had no evidences for atheism whatsoever. Rather, he just said, you know what? I can't believe what you believe because it doesn't make sense to me on. And then he went into the moral ground. And I said, dude, 
you have no grounds, you, you, you have no leg to stand on when it comes to morality because it can change with WAF, right? However, when I asked him, why do you believe in atheism? His response quite simply was, I can't get myself to believe in what you believe, so I just default to this. I'm like, why are you doing that to yourself, man? What's what's the deal? You're, you're upon greater faith than me, right? You have this faith into just the absolute falsehood, and you've taken no time to do due diligence. So as I'm talking about these concepts, and as I'm talking about the recipe of what's happening here, understand that there's people that are on the low end of that recipe, meaning that they're not utilizing their intellect in any which way, shape, or form. They're not utilizing their experiences in any which way, shape, or form. They're not inclined to take a look at the Quran, to take a look at the Sunnah, to take a look at any evidences for the existence of this faith and it being true. But yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy still, still gives them hope, which is the fitrah to me. The hope is, is evident because he stopped to talk to us. You understand what I'm saying? He literally stopped and said, let me hear what this is about. And that is the, the, the small candle that's still lit in this person's heart, right? If he didn't care, he would not have stopped at all. He would have just kept going, right? So anybody that comes to visit, right? We obviously, we have to treat them with that respect that that fitra is still calling out. And we hopefully encourage the, you know, the engine to start doing what it needs to do to recognize the rest. But, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that guides. So all that we can do is, again, deliver that message. And this is my favorite kind of dawah, by the way. You know, just this type where these people are, are, are ready and willing to listen. But then you see where they're at. You know, when they when they open up to you a little bit, you see like where what's stopping them. So just keep that stuff in mind um, of of how this recipe is blending with the people that you may know, uh, the people that you may have tried to talk to, and so on and so on and so on. Right? Meaning, every human being will have that fitra. The Prophet is fitra. Every child is born upon that innate fitra. So that fitra. In, in that we have as human beings, Allah just says in the Quran, He made us testify that He's our Lord. And then we said we testify, and then Allah said, So you do not say on the day of judgment. What what is it that you do not going to use as an excuse? What I told you two minutes ago. We didn't know. No one told us, you know, that you're our Lord. No one told us that God exists. Right. No one told us this, no one told us that. Allah is giving you the fitra. And that fitra will make you recognize the existence of Allah. And even, you know, the, the disbelievers, they have studies. And these studies show that the fitra is there. You have Oxford, Oxford University conducting a study. You have 57, uh, you have uh, 50. Okay, now, he does bring up these studies. I'm going to ask you guys, and I want an honest response in the chat. Do these studies matter? Like, for real, do they actually matter? Yes or no? Do these studies matter? Can we draw a conclusion without these studies to the existence of the fitra that is? So drop your drop your answers in the chat. Do they matter? Can we draw a conclusion that a fitra doesn't indeed exist? Okay, we got one yes. I wish I could put polls up here. By the way, it's it's super easy to respond to this uh, whether or not they they matter. What's difficult is answering why. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that to you guys. By the way, I'm not gonna ask you why. Okay, so we've got some opposition for an atheist. Yes. Okay. Good response. Okay, these are all really good responses. Re in reality, in reality, they do not matter. The studies do not matter because you have the Quran and you have the and the Sunnah, and this takes precedent over any single piece of scholarly work for the rest of history, period. Okay, it will always take a precedence. And that's the whole point of this exercise is when we're going through these, remember the four sources of knowledge. Remember that the Quran and the Sunnah take precedence over the Ijma and they take precedence over scholarship. Now, uh, there was a qualifying condition, right? For atheists, they do matter because we have to first prove that God does exist 
and then we have to prove um, they, that uh, the sunnah is there as well, right? So from an atheist standpoint, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to say, "Hey, uh, cool. Let me just give you the let me give you the benefit of the doubt that God does exist," and so on. Remember where their position is. Their position is God does not exist, right? So in that sense, the studies do matter. Okay, but in the grand scheme of things, the reason why I say they don't matter is because we don't look at those studies for the for the proof of God's existence. Right? Remember, you have it categorically. You have the fitra, you have the sharh, you have the his, and you have the aql. The studies are just one of these categories, which is the aql. Right? So this is again that you can now see how these categories are kind of fighting over one another and, and understand which one takes precedence, right? So the fit there's a weight to the fitra, and the weight of the fitra is greater, right, than the aqal. Okay. So uh keep that in mind. And this is this is what I mean by like the fun part of being able to articulate it. Okay, because to some people, you'll be able to speak pure experiences. Other people, you're going to be able to say, hey, you know what? Fine. Let's go ahead and explore your intellect on this. And let's take a look at scholarly articles and this, that, and the third. And you guys are going to go here and there. But it's very difficult to explore a bunch of scholarly articles and then have that person be honest with themselves and be honest with you and say, oh, you know what? You, you actually are making more sense and I'm going to lean your way. Rather, what they're going to do is they're going to suffer from confirmation bias and utilize something called heuristics, which are shortcuts, they're mental shortcuts, and they're going to look for articles in opposition to confirm their bias. So this is the challenge, right? And this is why it needs to be a recipe. Two or 57 academics. So he's going to list the academics and stuff like that. Digesting Barrett was an atheist, and they conduct a study. Uh, I want to bring it forward and just a bit. Allah this today. A lot of this is in the Quran, in Surah Al-Tur. What does he say? Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am hum al-khaliqu am khalaqu as-samawati wal ard bal la yuqin. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, were they created out of nothing? Allah gives you possibilities now, right? You you see this the social behavior of ants it is smarter than many human beings have met. This is the truth, you know? Smarter than many human beings have met. The ants have a queen. You know, have a hierarchy system. They have guards. They have prisons. You know, before us doing our prisons, they have prisons. We learn from the prisons. Yeah, they have prisons, right? They have punishments. They, they have armies that protect the queen. You know, they move uh, food. They store food for a long, long period of time. They have tactics and how they fight. Who taught them this? If you not know, look at this brain that you cannot even see, that is not even visible, how are they able to do this? There are things that are called termites. They're even smaller than ants. Exists in some parts of Africa. All right, and he used a beautiful example right there uh, in in regards to the instinctual nature that was placed within creatures. And then ant was a, was a fantastic example. I wanted to fast forward a little bit just for the brevity of time because uh, I didn't want the stream to no. go this long. And no one is admitted. And then um, our friend well, here. Law, I mean, it's a it's an amazing you subject. You believe him or not? You believe him? This is it's basic common sense. You know, to, isn't that very problematic that we don't know the answer? How are we expected to aid our brothers and sisters in Palestine? We don't even know what believing in Allah means. It's a problem, brothers. It's a problem. We need to take this matter seriously. And I, I did not just say, I'm going to speak about this for the sake of speaking about this. There's an issue. There are people who are not spending time learning these fundamental things. Allah has just created you for this. Allah has just says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا you were only commanded to worship Allah alone, sincerely. You were created for that reason. Allah said, There's a, again, just for the brevity of time. Singling Allah in these attributes. Meaning what? Meaning, if we say, uh, you know, this guy over there, uh, creator. Uh, uh. So now, okay, here's where he's at. Where he's at now is he's going back. We've, we've concluded the existence. So come back a level, okay? We're no longer exploring the, the existence anymore. We're on to the second one. The second uh, criteria, or the not, not criteria, but the second um, element of uh, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That'd be uh, close. Yes, it's, it's a part of the meaning. Good, part of the meaning, huh? 
Ha, Lord. Okay. Allah Azza wa Jal is the Rabb, meaning He is al, al, the Khalik, He is the Malik, and He is the Mudabbir. He is the Khalik, He is the Malik, He is the Mudabbir. He is the Creator, He is the owner of everything, and He is the one who is handling the affairs of all the creation. Al Khalik, Al Malik, Al Mudabbir, that's what the Lord Rabb means. Mm-hmm. So Allah Azza wa Jal, we believe in His Rububiyya, means we believe. Okay, so the first one was the existence, right? The second one is the Rububiya. And he listed a le- one layer deep into that Rububiya, which is to give you the explanation. Okay, the explanation is Al Halik, Al Malik, and Al Mudabbir. Okay, so we have the creator, the owner, uh, ownerships or mastership, master of all king kingship right and then you have uh the owner of affairs okay so again just to just to rewind for just a second this whole time that we have been talking this whole time that we've been listening to we're only on the second one so when he told remember when he told you oh yeah i read the book and it took me a year to explain it (laughs) or you know I, i taught it for a year and imagine the benefit that you would get in that year. Right? To single Allah Azza wa Jal with his actions. Creation is an action of Allah. And by the way, once again, a gentle reminder, no other religion has this explanation. Period. They have nothing but conjecture, man. They're worried about, you know, three in one and persons and essence and rubbish, dude. To own things is, a, is an action. To give life. To take life away. To give risk. All of that is from Tadbir. All of that is to handle the affairs of the creation, to give people provision, to take soul, souls from people, to mm-hmm. cause people to die, to give people life. Singling Allah Azza wa Jalla these attributes. Meaning what? Meaning, if we say, uh, you know, this guy over there, he also gives life and takes life. Then what happens now? What do we call that? Shirk. Why is it shirk? Because it's not singling Allah Azza wa Jalla in, the, in his actions. You have associated another partner with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And so trust me, we do associate with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Many of us associate with Allah Azza wa Jalla and don't even know it. Many of us associate with Allah Azza, uh, with Allah Azza wa Jalla and don't even know it. Some believe that medicine gives them, uh, the medicine is, the, is that which healed them. And by the way, this is a beautiful example. This is a beautiful, beautiful example. Uh, because um, it comes back to the root. The root is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that he gave us the intellect to craft this medicine, uh, and 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 for the for him to permit the actual body to take this medicine, and for the the reaction to actually exist, right? It, and it can I can go deeper and deeper and deeper, but I'm not gonna like drill into your brains right now because you know just out of respect, right? But the idea that that this um, invention which I don't like to call it an invention, I have to call it a discovery, was even uh, laid out for us to discover is a blessing, is a rahmah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he was the one that controlled the affair, right? He was the one that has lordship over it, and he was the one that delivered it to us uh, in, a, in a manner that, um, they don't you know, understand that, that we can take. is a reason, is a sabbath, and the one who heals is Allah. Right. The medicine is a means that Allah has given you, but the one who heals is Allah. Many exactly. of us will say, Alhamdulillah, this doctor is very great. I was healed because of him. No, Habib is not a doctor. Yeah, now you, you're, you're, you're encountering a problem. You don't even know you're encountering a problem. Many of us will say, Oh, my mother! And your mother, what brother? Why are you making an oath with other than Allah? Why are you making an oath with other than Allah? We, we do these, these things. We Subconsciously, people doing it. They're associating with Allah. You're making an oath with other than Allah. You only make... It happens on a day-to-day basis. You don't even notice it. You'll be fine because you didn't learn what? These things we're talking about. If you don't learn them, you'll be committing shirk in your day-to-day life. You don't even know what you're doing. So we said what? Singling Allah Azza wa Jalla and his actions. Right? See? Uh, so it's not wahdaniya. Uh, so far, all you have is the existence and uh, little wubiyya. Now, hold on. You had put... Um, Uh, it's the lordship. So he broke it down into three. Rububiyya is uh, uh, al-halat, 
al Malik and al Mudabbir. So we have a uh, creator, we have ownership, uh, 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 kingship, right? Uh, mastership, uh, which all falls under Malik. And uh, you have uh, al Mudabbir, which is the owner of affairs. So hopefully that answers that. Okay, so singling Allah Azza wa Jalla is the actions, meaning He alone is the one who does His actions, not like the previous some previous religions, the Lord of Light and the Lord of uh, Darkness. Yeah, one does one, uh, the Lord of Creation, and then the Lord of Giving Provision, and then the Lord of the Lord of War. And this is where you have Hinduism, right? They all have basically proxies. This is what this is the opposite of that of singling, not singling Allah Azza wa Jalla only in His attributes. So, so this thing of singling Allah Azza wa Jalla in His attributes. It's very easy to come with. Those who believe in Allah, most of them are like, yeah, of course I agree, Allah is the one of it. Most people who believe in God, if not all, if you say to them, do you believe God created? They say yes, right? You believe God is the one who gives life? You say yes. Even the disbelievers of Quraysh, did they admit to this or no? Even they did. Allah, you ask the, the disbelievers of Quraysh, but we still call them Mushrikeen. Allah is okay, called them Okay, let me fast forward again for the sake of time. That's why you see these magicians. How did they believe? This what are chicken worship, not just a worship. It is worship. So they are worshiping because Allah Azza wa Jalla Himself says in the Quran that to call upon is dua, is ibadah, is worship. Uh, I'm not understanding what, what you don't understand about it. It's I, it's literally. It is lordship, lordship in in the simplest put in the simple simplest frame possible. Lordship, supreme lordship, right? So uh, he's the lord of all creation. He's the owner of of anything and everything in existence. Uh, he is the sustainer. He's the chief of all affairs. This is this is just what I mean by lordship. So hopefully that helps clarify it for you, bro. The qualifier. So they are worshiping other than Allah by calling upon a person who can't even hear them. So the first thing is they're committing a problem here in the tawheed that we said in singling Allah Azza wa in the actions that we do. But they're also confirm that the quwwah, Allah Azza wa has, uh, he's a qawi, he has absolute strength. So we affirm the name, Allah, his name is al-qawi and the, the attributes, right? And inshallah, we'll okay. you know, go into more detail maybe in the next lecture. But it's one that fulfills their, their needs. Okay, now he doesn't actually see or he doesn't actually label it as such, um, but he actually puts it as, as uh, he blends the two categories um, of three and four. So we have uh, al-asma or was sifat. So you have the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why he alluded to earlier when he said, do you know the 99 names and the meanings? So once again, just a quick review. We have the existence, we have the Rububiyya, and he's touching up on Asma wa Sifat, which is the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Such as the one who gives life, the one who gives death, um, the sustainer, you know, the creator, and so on and so on and so on. Okay? So it's a huge problem. So we need to understand these things. We need to understand. What is the last thing? To believe in the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Allah Azza wa has names. Allah Azza wa has attributes. The names of Allah that we said, the 99 names that we're told, there are more, more, but the ones that we're told have attributes. That like Allah Azza wa is a Hakim means he's the wise. The attribute there is wisdom. We affirm the name that Allah, his name is a Hakim, and the attribute which that he is all wise. Right? We affirm that the quwa, Allah Azza wa has, uh, he's a qawi, he has absolute strength. So we affirm the name, Allah, his name is Al-Qawi, and the, the attributes, right? And inshallah, we can, you know, go into more detail maybe in the next lecture. I'm going to talk about this affirmation of the names and attributes because there's a lot of talk about it. And also the, the Uluhiyya thing maybe a little bit more. Uh, uh, inshallah, in the in the, in the the Okay. And then the fourth one that he touched up on was Uluhiyya. And uh, the best way that this is defined is the actions that we do, the intentions are strictly for our lost paths on it. So any action that's being conducted, whether it be like resting your body, going to work, minding your tongue, right? All these things, they are uh, conducted fisabilillah. So not only are you, uh, is your intention 
to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but your intention is to avoid the anger, uh, but also the gift of re uh, recognizing the gifts that were given to you in order to conduct those actions. So like, um, you know, alhamdulillah for the ability to have a good night's sleep, right? Alhamdulillah for the ability to wake up the next morning so that you can go and spend your energy in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And attributing that these actions that we are doing uh, are strictly available to us because he permitted its availability and bringing it full circle that the actions that we are doing are married with the intentions of recognizing that availability and recognizing it as a gift. So hopefully that makes sense because it's a little bit of a brain twister. Um, but in, in a nutshell, from the moment that you wake up, you should be happy that you've been given another day. So I'm going to try to put it as, as simply as possible. You should be happy that you've been given another day. As you're living through this day, you should be happy that your lungs are functioning to whatever capacity they're functioning, that your eyes are functioning to whatever capacity they're functioning. And the way that you can show that happiness and show that gratitude is by not smoking a cigarette, not filling your stomach up with things that are haram, uh, avoiding um, avoiding visuals that are haram, uh, avoiding things that, you know, to go into your ear that's haram, stuff like that, right? And that brings it full circle. So if you are conducting the actions of what is permissible and you are grateful for being able to conduct those actions of what is permissible, then your intention is in line with pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now for the people that are choosing to ignore that, then uh, they are, they're violating or they're disrespecting the uluhiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And obviously ebbs and flows, we're all different in our journey of, of how close we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not. But these four things, uh, again, no other religion has, period. So once again, it's the existence, Urububiya, Uruhiya, and uh, Sifat wa uh, Asma. And, and if you comprehensively look at it, right, this is uh, a great deal of how to properly approach a lost subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just from like this personal reflection of, or take take a moment and personally reflect on these four. Like obviously, I've had some time to reflect on it, but now that you're going through your you know day to day, it's not about overwhelming yourself and being like, oh man, you know, you I have to be on pins and needles. A lot of this stuff you actually do passively, and that in itself is a mercy from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's not like you have to sit there and think about, are you going to be blinking? Is your heart going to be beating? No. Um, but now that you you have categories of some things to look out for, the next time that you're faced with a decision, right, and that decision can lead to potential haram, then you'll know that you're disrespecting what, right? And whatever that may be, it'll become more recognizable to you. But alhamdulillah, you know, I thought I would share this or, or re-go through this stuff because now that you have it articulated, you can kind of see where you're at with your own journey and you can say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and revisit this and I'm going to see how I can apply it to increase my status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so on. So um, inshallah, hopefully it was beneficial. Uh, he goes to uh, Q&A here very shortly. Yesterday. You know? Um, and then it just, it just chops, right? So, uh, I, th this is all mostly Q and A, if I'm not mistaken. Muslim, he said, name yourself what Allah named you. And Muslim, the Muslim, the Mu'min, the servant of Allah. These are the names you give to yourself. You are a Muslim. Now, someone come and say, okay, but everyone says I'm a Muslim. Yes, everyone says I'm a Muslim, but not everyone believes the same thing. If you see what they believe, you listen to them. Are they using Quran and Sunnah? Do they say things according to the Quran and Sunnah? Do they believe in the names of the Do they do these things? No. So they can call themselves potato for all I care. It doesn't matter what you call yourself because you can say, okay, I'm going to call my sect the greatness, you know, the great people. Okay, we are the great people. Okay. If yeah, I think at this point he was just kind of adding some reinforcing stuff um, in regards to like uh, 
sectarianism and then like because we're supposed to hold on tight to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rope is really Quran and Sunnah and then um, obviously the other uh, things to help us with that support is the ijma as well as the, the following the righteous predecessors okay so the idea now is that where he was getting at with this um, in his concluding statements was uh, stop developing these types of you know strange labels yeah exactly um exactly this right stop developing these types of strange labels if somebody asks you you know what school of thought do you fall under and, and so on and so forth it really is just quran and sunnah mm -hmm. and the schools of thought are meant to uh, elaborate on things but they share like 99.9 percent .9 similarities right like they don't differ they don't differentiate on matters of aqidah period they just don't right so there's rulings on other things that are case specific and so on and so forth so if somebody is like oh what do you fall under it's quran and sunnah what did abu Bakr fall under what was the school of thought of the prophet what was the school of thought of ali what was the school of thought of omar no <laughs> right it didn't work that way okay so as the as things need to be um uh I want to say adapted, right? Because Islam, alhamdulillah, is adaptive to whatever the circumstances are. Then there's going to be certain rulings and stuff uh, and certain uh, shari'i things that are going to have to be adapted, right? Now, the things that are mentioned in Quran and Sunnah, uh, especially matters of aqidah, there's no adaptation there, right? And there's no, there's no give. But, uh, you know, on something like, okay, what's considered capital punishment, you know, or what's considered this or what's considered that, you know, um, if there's a more humane way of, you know, administering whatever the capital punishment may be, or, you know, if there's a more, um, you know, a, uh, what are the circumstances on acquiring a mortgage and blah, 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 you know, you're going to have a difference of opinion. And then obviously you go towards wherever the evidence weighs more. And that's the beauty of Islam is you have the ability to makes small things like that, uh, these nuances that are case specific, right? That's where we would seek out scholarship. But in, in, in regards to Aqidah, no, there's no such thing as a school of thought. So Alhamdulillah. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to say my salams. Thanks so much for coming in, tuning in. And uh, hopefully I'll have some more of these streams more frequently. I did miss you guys as a community. I've just been traveling a lot, doing a lot of stuff. Um, as we all should be. So inshallah, it was a benefit. And thanks so much for your time and your patience. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you guys all. And uh, please don't forget to take the necessary steps to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Increase your own iman and uh, make the for our brothers and sisters all around the world, uh, particularly right now in Arafah. Okay, barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Anything that I said uh, that's an error, by the way, is uh, purely for me and shaitan. And anything that is uh, correct and true is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. And uh, they are free from any mis uh, mistakes. So uh, I just wanted to clarify that as well. Okay, guys. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.